So welcome back everyone after tea break and uh, this is the final session of today and it is the symposium number 10 uh, which is going to be chaired by Dr. Vasanthi Vijayanayaka and Dr. SHR Sanjeeva. Over to you sir. Good evening and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, the last symposium of the day on controversies and new concepts in rectal can colorectal cancer management is the topic, uh, is the theme of, the, of this session. And I would like to invite Mr. Selvaseker, Shelaya Selvaseker, to uh, start the session uh, with on place of HIPEC in colorectal cancer management. And Mr. Seker has been uh, very close to us for a long period by training. A uh, lot of our surgeons, and uh, and he's uh, working at Christie, United Kingdom, and uh, he's uh, involved a lot with uh, high pec management of uh, patients with peritoneal. Uh, uh, metastasis of colorectal cancer. Over to you, Mr. Seker. Just uh, um, to start off, there are uh, a lot of confusion regarding the terminologies used to describe peritoneal metastasis of colorectal origin. They are not uh, truly peritoneal carcinomatosis as it is not a carcinoma of the peritoneum. Peritoneal metastasis of colorectal origin peritoneal, colorectal peritoneal metastasis, colorectal peritoneal metastasis with the abbreviation CPM and CRPM are commonly used. This is important uh, as uh, one reviews the literature, uh, it needs to be clear what um, the uh, condition the authors are describing. Um, colorectal peritoneal metastasis is about 10 to 15 percent of um, metastasis from colorectal um, cancer. The standard treatment used to be palliative chemotherapy. Uh, when we look at the natural history, the prognosis, unfortunately, is really bad um, compared to uh, the liver metastasis, where um, the prognosis have certainly improved in the last um, uh, last decade or so uh, with aggressive surgery and multimodal treatment. Uh, the treatment for lung metastasis has improved. However, patients with peritoneal metastasis, as you, we can see from this uh, um, survival curve, is uh, very poor. This is a patient, uh, I've got three cases to describe the three scenarios, good, bad, and ugly. This is a patient um, who had abdominal distension uh, with an elevated CEA. As one can see, there's extensive disease around the liver and uh, in the porta, um, and also there is a lot of disease around the small bowel mesentery, which means that these patients truly uh, don't benefit from um, surgical intervention, as a matter of fact, can be harmed. And <clears throat> these patients are sent uh, for supportive care and um, pa um, palliative uh, this is a second case, <clears throat> which is a <clears throat> patient with uh, right-sided uh, um, um, GI symptoms with anemia. Uh, the external MGT confirmed a senicolon carcinoma with peritoneal metastasis. Patient went through our peritoneal tumor uh, service MDT, a great for cytoreductive surgery and high pack. At the time of surgery, these are um, miliary deposits in the small bowel mesentery, which can be removed on block, and there is a benefit in offering these patients um, cytoreductive surgery and high pack, which I will touch upon a bit later based on the uh, PCI score, which is a peritoneal cancer score. This is a good um, uh, patient uh, who had a screen-detected cancer, as we all know, have uh, early-stage disease, um, 
unfortunately had a mental disease um, at the time of surgery, um, had um, a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy, and um, the following which went on to have a cytoreductive surgery and high pec. This patient truly benefits from having this uh, surgery with heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So these are the three in the spectrum, uh, three patients in the spectrum of uh, um, the condition where um, one truly benefits from um, cytoreductive surgery and high pec. The second one, we are not sure. The third one, certainly, we <clears throat> cause more harm than. Um, when we look at uh, the role of systemic anti cancer treatment, if we don't give any chemotherapy, these patients unfortunately don't live beyond um, uh, 16 to uh, 24 months. Um, giving 5-FU, uh, the survival slightly is better, and giving combination chemotherapy, which is oxaloplatin-based chemotherapy, the survival uh, increases even further. Uh, whereas in selected group of patients um, who have uh, uh, cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC, uh, the survival is uh, very good. It's about 40% five-year survival is what we quote uh, to our patients. Uh, but these are picking up the good apples <clears throat> from, uh, uh, unfortunately, bad uh, prognostic. Uh, um, so what does cytoreactive surgery and high pec mean? It removes, it is not a disease where you remove all the peritoneum. It removes, uh, we remove the uh, diseased peritoneum, diseased viscera, ablation of liver surface and removal of high risk target organs. What are these? Uh, these are ovaries um, and the omentum. Um, and then this is followed by heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy with mitomycin C for 90 minutes. Um, and um, in some centers based on um, um, what the patient has had previously, oxaloplatin is also used, which I will touch upon a bit later, which is used for 30 minutes with 5-FU uh, infusion for about 30 minutes before um, administering oxaloplatin. So completeness of cytoreduction, how is it described? A CC0 uh, is there's no disease left at the end of the procedure. CC1 is when there is uh, 25, um, 25 millimeters um, uh, of um, disease left behind. Um, CC2 is um, when it is 0.25 centimeters to 2.5 centimeters and less CC0. Uh, uh, three is when it is greater than 2.5 centimeters of disease, which are basically what we would consider as an operation. When we look at the evidence, Elias et al. published quite a bit uh, comparing cytoreductive surgery and modern systemic chemotherapy. He showed that in selected group of patients, the survival, um, we can expect around 51% uh, five-year survival, um, and the median survival was 62 months compared to 24 months uh, in patients who have had uh, Cancer treatment. And similarly, he did a multi center study um, which showed um, these results can be achieved with a low mortality of 3%, median survival of 33 months, and a five year survival of 27%. Um, so, what are the positive prognostic factors is achieving the complete site reduction at the end of surgery if there's no disease left behind and a PCI score of less than 20, no involved lymph nodes, and the use of adjuvant systemic chemotherapy where prognostic factors. Uh, um, which showed that these patients benefit, uh, this condition benefits from uh, such. Um, this is the only randomized controlled trial which was published um, in 2010. There has been a recent uh, randomized controlled trial which has caused confusion, which is Prodigy 7, which I will touch upon a bit later. Here, um, cytoreductive surgery and high pec um, was used uh, compared with systemic anti cancer treatment. The high pec used was mitomycin C for 90 minutes, and they showed the survival at eight years of 25% uh, survival, whereas there was none who were on systemic anti cancer treatment uh, who survived beyond 16 months. Based on this, uh, NICE, um, which is a National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence, uh, came up with a guidance in 2005, 2010, and 2021, uh, where they showed uh, that um, uh, cytoreductive surgery and heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy can be used um, in patients with selective uh, conditions, which included colorectal peritoneal metastasis um, for, um, as a treatment option. Um, um, uh, in selected group of 
So is there a role for prophylactic HIPEC uh, in local advanced disease? The Colopex study was published, which unfortunately showed no evidence. Uh, basically, these are patients with T4 disease and also in patients um, who had a, a second local laparotomy with HIPEC was a surveillance in high risk group profilo chip study. Both showed no evidence of HIPEC. So virtually there's no evidence of HIPEC in patients with local advanced disease. Um, and also in patients um, who had high risk uh, um, cancers, which are perforated cancers or obstructing cancers um, or signet cell carcinomas, uh, there's been no evidence to suggest that there is a role. The Prodigy 7, which I touched upon a bit earlier, uh, which was published uh, this year, um, show is a randomized controlled trial comparing cytoreductive surgery and cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC. In um, colorectal peritoneal metastasis, they showed absence of overall survival adding um, by adding HIPEC, and uh, the uh, patients who had HIPEC also had late postoperative complications. But in this study, we need to be clear that the, the HIPEC used was oxaloplatin, which is known uh, to increase the post op complications, bleeding, and other um, um, complications. Um, whereas uh, the previous study published by Varval, um, they used mitomycin C. Uh, but what they showed was high quality cytoreductive surgery certainly ha has a benefit in these patients. Uh, so at the Christie, we have had a program since 2002. Um, what we know is case selection is critical. If you operate on the right patients, you can achieve a CC0, CC1 in 86% of the patients. These are the patients who um, have um, good survival. Unfortunately, as we all know, if we leave cancer cells behind, which happens in CC2, CC3, they all come back with disease. And the MD MDT is crucial. Decision making is crucial. As we have as see, 60% um, <clears throat> of the patients are sent back saying uh, they are not suitable for um, surgery, um, and um, uh, only 40% are offered uh, surgery. And that number is um, staying the same or slightly come down as we see increased referrals. Uh, but the, uh, this is where the decision making is the key in these patients. So when we look at our survival, as we can clearly see, uh, there is a, a huge um, difference between those who had cytoreactive surgery and HIPEC versus uh, debulking surgery. We quote a figure of about 40 percent. Um, and in pseudomyxoma peritonei, uh, which is another condition where HIPEC is used just to touch upon, although it's not relevant to the topic discussion today, um, if one achieves a CC0, CC1, um, there's a 90 percent uh, five year survival. And in appendix cancer, we say that um, as um, we can see, there is about 60% five-year survival using cytoreductive surgery. So what are the um, outcomes um, from uh, which where the patients benefit from cytoreductive surgery hypec? The conditions are CRPM, which is colorectal peritoneal metastasis, appendix neoplasm, which is uh, mainly pseudomyxoma peritoneal and appendix cancer, because these uh, cancers have high um, uh, incidence of uh, being um, um, uh, having peritoneal metastasis. It is a significant procedure and it needs to be done in a specialist centralized unit to avoid complications um, the patients. Uh, so to conclude, um, cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC is uh, used in the treatment of PMP appendix cancers and colorectal peritoneal metastasis. The key is um, complete cytoreduction, um, which is a key HIPEC. The evidence in colorectal peritoneal metastasis is still not known. Uh, there is more evidence required, but high quality surgery really makes a difference. And um, long term survival is achievable. Uh, exact role is not known. The interest in second look laparotomy for high risk group is there, but the current evidence. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Selosekar. Uh, the next uh, uh, speaker is uh, going to be uh, Mr. Chanindra Varusavitana. Uh, he is a consultant uh, colorectal surgeon at uh, St. Mark Hospital in the United Kingdom. And he has uh, been helping uh, for us for several workshops as well in the past. And he is going to uh, talk about uh, transcranial uh, TME in low rectal cancer. Uh, over to you, Jayendra. Hello, everyone, and 
Thank you very much for asking me to present today at this meeting. I'm sorry I can't be there personally, but I hope that sometime uh, in the future we'll all be able to meet personally. Today I'm going to talk to you about transanal TME and uh, especially in lower rectal cancer. So I think if you're going to do transanal TME, the first thing you have to do is you have to have a very good organization of your theater, and that's really important. Especially remember that there is still going to be an abdominal portion as well as a transanal portion. And you, your scrub nurses and your entire team has to be very aware of where everything is so that things don't make a mess. And for that, there has to be some very clear planning well beforehand. And this is basically, as you can see, what we have, there's a abdominal approach, there's a, a transanal approach down there, and, and that's um, how we develop the system. This is the sort of um, tools we need for the transanal approach. You can see the air seal, we, uh, um, which is essential to maintain the pressure within that transanal approach. Um, and uh, the rest uh, is pretty much the same as your laparoscopic equipment. Now let's ask, uh, ask ourselves why we would uh, look at transanal TME. And I think there are some limitations in the laparoscopic TME, especially uh, when you have a very narrow pelvis, for example. So there's a limited access to the distal pelvis. If you have multiple stapler firings, you get zigzag stapling, and there's about a 5% risk of leak, five time risk of leak. Um, retraction can be difficult um, and the distal margin, determining the distal margin, especially in very low rectal cancer, can be quite difficult. Um, and there are a few randomized control trials which have shown inferiority to open surgery. And that's another questionable issue as to um, um, what the benefit of that is. And it's not really the purpose of this talk, but just to highlight some of the issues. So if we were to do it, and if I am to do it, this is how I sort of organize it. Uh, you can see the abdominal scrub nurse, the abdominal surgeons are there, the peri perianal scrub nurse is there, uh, and uh, I, myself and the assistant would sit there, and uh, you can see where all the stacks, et cetera, are. Now, it's really important to understand how you're going to deal with this situation, because if you're coming from the abdominal way, you will be taking this approach. But when you're starting to do it through the transanal approach, you've got to be very careful about how you approach the rectum, because remembering that as you start, the, 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 the initial part um, of, of the TME is very low. I'm very grateful to Roel Hompis, who has given me a lot of the slides for this um, talk in particular, just to highlight some of the issues. So why the transanal approach? Well, it's established as an alternative approach to the rectal excision. It potentially overcomes some of the issues associated with the laparoscopic excision. And if done properly, it can actually give very good outcomes. So um, this here is um, the first thing we would think about, and, and, and it is the purse string. The purse string is incredibly important because unlike, unlike but performing it from the laparoscopic way, you're actually starting to make an incision uh, just below your tumor. And therefore um, you need to make sure that the tumor cells don't um, um, fall anywhere or spread within where you make the incision. And this has become one of the biggest issues, um, especially in terms of your learning curve. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So having a very tight and very um, uh, good purse string is absolutely key to, to this operation. And, and if you have an open purse string, then you know you're in trouble before you start. So it's worth it if you don't feel good about your purse string to actually do another one um, uh, in the, under these circumstances. And you can put it about two or three centimeters above the cord. Um, and then, and then once you've got the purse string and you know that there is no leak, the next step is to make your incision. And the, and the first thing we do is we make um, a, um, a, 
a diathermy effect, if you like, uh, as to where we think we would be um, making the incision or the rectotomy, as we call it. And then you make a muscle incision, which will be the first part of it, which will then take you directly into the TME plane, as you can start to see here. And, and once you get into that plane, you can open it and it's important to open it circumferentially so that you have a very good approach um, to be able to find the uh, TME plane. Now, remember that especially posteriorly as you're going past, you, you need to almost dip downwards as you could see from the um, MRI that I showed you before. And this is really important. But also, as you can see from here, the entire muscle there has to be removed completely. Otherwise, again, you're going to lose um, your plane. And you can see this very clearly here. And then as you go through, you can start to see the um, TME plane. Now, there are, there are certain problems that can happen as well. And you can see here, um, uh, we, we'll be talking about some of the pitfalls. And you can see, you think that this is uh, the TME plane and, and quite rightly, you can see all, all, all the right places. But as you um, go through, um, despite uh, uh, taking the approach that it is the TME plane, you can start to see that you're actually quite low and um, you, you, you're starting to see the sacrum. And this is where you can run into trouble, especially with the sacral veins and cause bleeding. So it is very important to ensure that you have a very good um, plane um, and, and being well above, not well below the TME plane demonstrated here. And then um, as, as, as you, you made that approach, again, have a look at it, be very slow, uh, especially in the initial approaches and make sure you know exactly where your plane is and then using the diathermy. And I tend to use a very uh, low um, uh, uh, setting and, and then uh, using the diathermy, you, you will um, gradually dissect out the TME plane. And um, this is uh, incredibly um, important. And uh, especially anteriorly, you need to see here's your denon villiers fascia. And again, make sure you have the right um, this, uh, 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 retraction in, it, uh, in order to make sure that you have the right dissection. And uh, as, as you go through, you, you will see a very beautiful um, TME dissection, and this is what you need to approach. And, and it doesn't hurt to look, as you can see here, um, in various directions. Um, and then you can join up with the abdominal surgeons. Uh, and realistically, how far you go will very much depend on uh, the patient um, as well as um, what the abdominal surgeons do. And here again, you can see that uh, it's very nicely done um, with, with, with the right approach. And at this point, you're getting help from the abdominal surgeons and where you can't do it abdominally, uh, you will do it transanally and where you can't do it transanally, you will do it uh, abdominally and so on and so forth. Right. So the next thing that comes about is the urethral injury. And the urethral injury has been the biggest thing that everybody describes. And again, you can see here that this is the green line shows the, the area that we need to perform as the intersphincteric dissection. This is where we go. But if you go in the wrong direction, you, you can hit the urethra and sometimes even remove the prostate. And, and, and the, the key here, again, is to ensure that when you actually take um, the dissection all the way around, that, that you stay within the TME plane. If you start to see the pelvic uh, muscles on the side, then you know you're on the wrong plane. And that's when you will run into trouble. 
The next important thing with, about the transanal approach is that you get a good anastomosis. Now, for those of you who don't have the technique or haven't got the training in transcendental approach. You, if you look at my colleague Antonino Spinelli has recently written about the TTSS, which allows you to do a laparoscopic dissection all the way down, but just to make that final this uh, final uh, tra uh, transaction transanally, so you're able to uh, uh, perform the anastomosis as well. And this is how um, I uh, perform the anastomosis. So you then, uh, once you've made the dissection, remove the rectum, you will then perform a um, purse string uh, all, all the way around um, in a full thickness approach, seeing, seeing very carefully. And then um, th th this is not for a low, low rectal cancer, this is for a pouch, but you can see that there are special um, dissection, um, uh, special uh, um, circular staplers that have the long um, uh, anvils, which uh, allow for uh, very good uh, anastomosis as well as very good donuts, as you can see there. Now, if you're looking for risk factors for anastomotic failure, you can see that if, if you're a male, if you're more than 30 uh, um, uh, kilo, uh, BMI greater than 30, if you're a smoker, if you're diabetic, uh, and your tumor size is more than 25 millimeters, as, as you start to add those risk factors, your risk of anastomotic failure increase as well. And we can see from our initial registry data um, that, uh, um, uh, the, 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 these are the um, uh, things we, we found. Um, and uh, for poor specimen outcome, uh, uh, low rectal tumors and uh, uh, so on and so forth. So the important thing is to have a training program. And I think having a very good training program, and I think the numbers we, we would probably say where you start to become very good is about 40. And and this is this is the way we manage our training program in the in the in the UK, uh, but we we um, have been hit by some of the problems. For example, in Norway, where the the local recurrence rate was uh, incredibly high, uh, and therefore they they banned doing TATME. But I think that I think banning the technique is probably not the approach. I think the approach is to make sure that you, you uh, train people appropriately, or maybe you have a group of people within your country or your organization or whichever way you want to place it, who have the understanding of the technique and are able to perform it so that if you choose the right patients to go to those uh, surgeons, then you will have better outcomes than having everybody trying to do the one technique. So it's like anything, you develop your toolbox and you say, here are the patients that need this technique, here are the patients that need that technique. And how you avoid Norway, and you can see, for example, in the USA, there were 400 surgeons who were trained and only 25 were concerned, considered high volume surgeons. And, and it's that high volume that you need. And you can see here again from the Netherlands data, there are only very few surgeons uh, who, uh, who have high volumes of TATME. It does have a place, and you can see this is the anastomotic leak rate, much less lower, uh, and again, uh, uh, circumferential resection margin much better if done properly, and function remains the same. I'm okay. going, uh, but it's um, really important um, to uh, m have a good understanding of what you're dealing with. Um, so I'm sorry about this, uh, what you're dealing with, and then um, come up with uh, the right people. So who would benefit? I think males would definitely benefit if you have a narrow pelvis with maybe an acute angle, that would be beneficially beneficial and maybe patients with radiotherapy as well. So in conclusion, I think TATME is certainly a very good alternative uh, for TME surgery. Um, 
uh, it gives you the possibility of perhaps a better anastomosis. It's able to determine tumor height much better, and it avoids multiple stapler firings. But the importance is about the learning curve and training program. And I think one of the best ways of dealing with it is to have a group of surgeons within an institution or within uh, an organization or within a country, uh, rather than try to have everyone do the technique because the numbers would be very low. Thank you again. Thank you, Janindra. Uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Professor April uh, Camilla Roslani. She's the uh, Professor of Surgery and uh, Head of the uh, Department of Colorectal Surgery and the President of uh, College of Surgeons and Academy of uh, Medicine of Malaysia. And she's going to uh, talk about the targeted uh, therapy in uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about targeted therapies for colorectal cancer. This is a very broad topic, and in the time available, I will focus on a brief description of the mechanisms for colorectal carcinogenesis, the molecular patterns in colorectal cancer, and how this has impacted therapeutic strategies. Although targeted therapy and immunotherapy, strictly speaking, have different definitions, targeted therapy is focusing on inhibition of tumor growth stimulating pathways, while immunotherapy stimulates tumor destruction, for the purposes of this talk, there will be some overlap. I would like to acknowledge my colleague, Professor Ho Bo Fang, a clinical oncologist who helped me with this presentation. I have no other disclosures related to this talk. It's worth remembering that the oncologist Kedi, in his presidential address back in 1997, already recognized the importance of tumor biology in determining outcomes, much to the chagrin of surgeons. For individualized cancer um, treatment, we therefore have to combine better precision, i.e. better targeting, with better value, which combines evidence-based treatment with cost-effectiveness and patient-centered outcomes. For this talk, I will focus on the precision aspect in sporadic colorectal cancers. This slide summarizes the better known mechanisms for colorectal carcinogenesis. The vast majority of sporadic colorectal cancers are driven by mutations in the APC, RAS, and BRAF genes. Mutations result either in inactivation of tumor suppressor genes or activation of oncogenes, leading to signal transduction failure and subsequent cancer development. But as you can see from this slide, despite the identification of a number of molecular targets, targeted and immunotherapies are still reserved for the treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer, as no benefit has been shown in earlier stages. What is interesting, however, is that the pattern of mutations is site-dependent, with white-sided tumors having a greater preponderance of BRAF mutations, for instance, as seen in this diagram. This has important prognostic and therapeutic implications, as sporadic right-sided cancers occur in older patients and are associated with poorer outcomes. Epidermal growth factor inhibition is the best studied therapeutic strategy with targets including the EGF receptor and the downstream RAS genes. Vascular endothelial growth factor inhibition is another therapeutic strategy targeting VEGF itself, the VEGF receptor, or inhibition of the downstream tyrosine kinase, but is perhaps less effective than EGF inhibition. Further analysis of the molecular and clinical patterns allows us to classify colorectal cancer into four subtypes, which could provide a framework for molecularly targeted therapies. 
I will address the current evidence for five of these targets, namely RAS, BRAC, HER2, PIC3CA, and MSI. We'll start with RAS. The RAS group extends beyond KRAS and includes NRAS as well as mutations in exons other than exon 2. The BIA3 study showed that porphyry in combination with EGFR blockade was more effective than in combination with VEGF blockade. Similarly, adding panitinumab to porphyry also improves objective response rate although this has not been shown to improve survival. Downstream blockade of KRAS with sotarasib or adagrasib has also been explored. Two trials are ongoing. The first is the code break 100 study, which studied sotarasib. Unfortunately, most patients have since progressed since study commencement. The second is the CRYSTAL-2 study, which studied adagrasib. Although ORR appears promising, we await reports on survival. Moving on to BRAF. BRAF mutations are associated with poorer outcomes, especially with irinotecan-based regimens, and BRAF blockade alone is ineffective. Encorafinib blocks BRAF, while bimetinib acts further downstream, so combining them with EGF blockade is a possible strategy. The Beacon trial evaluated cetuximab in combination with encorafenib alone or with binimetinib in patients with BRAF mutant metastatic colorectal cancer. Results show that overall survival in both doublet and triplet regimens were superior to standard regimens. It was inferred that there was no difference between doublet and triplet regimens, although the methodology did not allow for direct comparison. What about HER2? HER2 is a driver of resistance to cetuximab in metastatic colorectal cancer. Taking a leaf out of breast cancer regimens, the Heracles study utilized trastuzumab in combination with lapatinib for HER2 amplified colorectal cancer, which has failed conventional therapies and measured the response radiologically. The ORR was a promising 30%, but we await to see if survival is positively impacted. In the DESTINY study, patients who had failed conventional therapy were stratified according to their pattern of HER2 amplification and treated with trastuzumab deruxtecan, an antibody drug conjugate of humanized anti-HER2 antibody with topoisomerase 1 inhibitor payloads. Again, ORR and safety are promising, but this requires longer study. We move on to PIC3CA. PIC3CA is a major downstream signaling hub of EGFR. Mutations lead to cancer proliferation, and PIC3CA mutant colorectal cancers are more frequently left sided. This already has a therapeutic implication. Post-diagnostic aspirin use is associated with improved survival in PIC3CA mutant cancers. Finally, what are the updates regarding microsatellite instability in colorectal cancer? While up to 20% of colorectal cancers are MSI high, this is less common in stage four. Pembrolizumab is a monoclonal antibody which blocks the programmed cell death one protein. Interaction with its ligands, PDL1 and PDL2, which are on the surface of activated T cells under normal conditions. This results in the inhibition of immune mediated killing of tumor cells and has been shown to have efficacy 
in other cancers such as melanoma. In the Keynote 177 study, metastatic MSI high colorectal cancers were treated with pembrolizumab or either for box or for piri in combination with either bevacizumab or cetuximab. Progression-free survival was significantly better in the pembrolizumab arm with fewer adverse effects. Nevertheless, although there was a trend towards improved overall survival with fewer adverse effects, this did not reach statistical significance. It is clear, therefore, that in order to deliver treatment with precision, we have to consider not only the driver genes and the associated genetic and epigenetic mutations, but also the transcriptomic pathways and stroma immune microenvironment, which combine to give a unique clinical presentation. It also means that for optimal outcomes, we will have to move from the single gene, single drug model to one that targets the entire microenvironment in a multi-molecular, multi-drug fashion. In summary, colorectal cancer is a heterogeneous disease with different genetic and epigenetic alterations. Molecular subtyping shows a shift in the colorectal cancer molecular patterns from right to left colon, requiring precision tailoring of therapies. Current strategies in metastatic colorectal cancer have thus shifted from single drugs targeting a single gene to multiple drugs targeting multiple molecules to improve OS and PFS. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Brother Rajdhani, for that uh, very enlightening talk. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Rodrigo Perez from Brazil. And he would be talking about total neo one therapy in rectal cancer. Over to you, Rodrigo. Hello, everyone. Um, it's First of all, it's a real pleasure to be here with you guys from Sri Lanka. Um, I have to say I've never been to Sri Lanka. I would simply love to, to go there sometime. So it's a real pleasure for me to be connected with you um, today. Now I'm going to talk about total new adjuvant therapy for rectal cancer. Um, these are my disclosures. Now, the concept behind total new adjuvant therapy is really offering patients all radiation and systemic chemotherapy treatment before surgery um, to improve basically two um, clinically relevant outcomes. When we offer these patients all of the chemotherapy and all of the radiation therapy before surgery, we're really looking to achieve improvements in survival and improvements in response. Now, if you think about it, the components can be divided into radiation therapy and chemotherapy. Radiation therapy only exclusively affects response. Chemotherapy, in contrast, in contrast uh, offers a, a significant impact in both response, but also on survival for these patients. So whenever we are thinking about giving TNT with the two components, we really have to understand what is it that we want to achieve um, in these patients. Now, if you're interested in response, and in my opinion, there are only two good reasons for you to think about response in rectal cancer. You may be interested in response, number one, because your patient has a threaten mesorectal fascia. Now, any cancer that is below the peritoneal reflection who has a threatened mesorectal fascia probably benefits from TNT to achieve some degree of response. So this is number one. Number two are patients who want or you are interested in response 
because you're interested in offering them organ preservation strategies. Now, organ preservation can be achieved by either a complete clinical response or a near complete clinical response uh, when you're thinking about organ preservation. We're gonna deal with organ preservation here as, as a group of patients who achieve a complete clinical response. Now, these patients, you're interested in offering complete clinical response, they have to be tumors that are located at the level of or below the anal rectal ring. We would generally not offer uh, the possibility of organ preservation for patients with tumors throughout the rectum. Even below the peritoneal reflection, we would only restrict the opportunity for organ preservation for those patients with tumors at the level of the inner rectal ring or below it, as you can see uh, in this high resolution MRI. Now, concept number three, people often uh, mistake or uh, mix up uh, two different concepts. Now, complete clinical response is one thing and complete pathological response is an entire different clinical entity. Now, complete pathological response, I would probably challenge you that in, in current day and age is probably useless for our patients. So for that purpose, if you're thinking about response and we're thinking about organ preservation as the sole reason for offering patients TNT, I would challenge you that the only benefit is the achievement of a complete clinical response. Now, once you achieve the complete clinical response, it doesn't really matter what treatment you've received before. Patients who have achieved a complete clinical response and sustained it for a number of years, it doesn't really matter baseline staging and it doesn't really matter the exact chemo radiation therapy regimen because the achievement of a complete clinical response by itself is the main determinant of outcome among these patients. It doesn't really matter what kind of treatment they receive. If you look at these curves, you will see that the blue and green curves, they become uh, almost identical once patients have achieved a complete clinical response. So what it means is even patients who have received low dose radiation therapy, once they achieve the complete clinical response, then it doesn't make a difference. The question is, what kind of treatment should I choose or select to offer my patient the best chances to achieve a complete clinical response? And this is, this is probably the, the key question. Now, uh, if you remember, the chances of achieving a complete clinical response with old fashioned chemo radiation was around 22-25%. The incorporation of consolidation chemotherapy dramatically changed those numbers. If you, if you look at our own data a long time ago, we've included additional cycles of chemotherapy, not only during radiation therapy, but also during the resting period. And you can see that the inclusion or addition of chemotherapy cycles to the old chemo radiation regimen dramatically increased the response rate of patients achieving a complete clinical response. Now, the same observation was reported from the timing trial. The timing trial was done in the United States. This is a prospective trial where patients receive progressively higher number of cycles of chemotherapy. And you can see them R number one, two, three, and four have increased the amount of time interval, but also the amount of cycles of chemotherapy. And you can see that the complete pathological response rate increased significantly as you uh, include consolidation chemotherapy. Now, the next question is, does the order of chemotherapy affect the degree of response? Now, this was studied by the OPRA trial in the United States. They basically compared two different strategies, induction chemotherapy before radiation or consolidation chemotherapy after radiation. Again, they were looking into response and looking into survival. Now, what's most interesting about this study 
is the fact that they used as the primary endpoint complete clinical response and not pathological response. And when, we, when they looked into the three-year survival outcomes, you can see there was no difference in offering patients induction or consolidation in terms of uh, distant metastasis-free survival. However, when they looked into complete clinical response achievement and avoidance of radical surgery, and therefore organ preservation was successful, you can see that patients who underwent consolidation chemotherapy were more likely to achieve a complete clinical response and avoid radical surgery. So it looks like consolidation chemotherapy is actually better than induction chemotherapy in terms of response and no worse in terms of survival. Now remember the 50% rate of complete clinical response, pretty much the same to what we had in the past with 5-FU only used as consolidation chemotherapy. Now, the next question was, can we use a different type of radiation? Can we use short course radiation therapy instead of long course radiation therapy? Now, the Rapido trial examined the role of consolidation chemotherapy and short course radiation therapy. Now, what was interesting about this study was the fact that the experimental arm had nearly doubled the chances of achievement of a complete pathological response. Now remember, complete pathological response is a different clinical entity. Here you can see a complete pathological response on the left in a patient that could have never been treated by uh, organ preservation strategies because of this significant ulceration of the rectum. This was still a complete pathological response but it would have never been translated into organ preservation. Problem number two, we don't really need uh, uh, know whether the increase in the pa complete pathological response rates observed in a repeater trial were, were exclusively due to the short course radiation therapy. Why? Because there are many variables that could have influenced the complete pathological response rate. The short course radiation therapy, the consolidation chemotherapy, and also the extremely long interval period between short course radiation and actually surgery being performed. So we really don't know whether short course radiation therapy is good enough for organ preservation. Now, this is Professor Bushko here, who is one of the, one of the most uh, uh, important scientists dedicated a lot of work to short course radiation therapy. And he himself was interested whether in the context of consolidation chemotherapy, whether short course radiation therapy could have been good enough for organ preservation, for a complete clinical response. And when he looked into the complete pathological response rate between both groups, there was really no difference between arms. However, when he looked into the differences in the complete clinical response between short course and long course radiation therapy in the context of consolidation chemotherapy, clearly long course chemoradiation therapy had significantly higher rates of a complete clinical response and the possibility of organ preservation. We currently have an ongoing trial in, in Germany where patients are being recruited as we speak and until we have data from this trial, I would strongly uh, uh, favor that. Number one, if you're interested in response, you definitely need to use some type of TNT regimen. If you're thinking about response and organ preservation, which is one of the main reasons for using both components of TNT regimens, consolidation is clearly better than induction and long course radiation therapy seems to be so far better than short course in offering the patient best chances of achieving a complete clinical response and avoiding radical surgery altogether. Uh, I hope he, uh, you, you, you uh, uh, appreciated these, these concepts and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, during discussion. Thank you very much. Then, thank you, Perez. And um, 
I hope the panelists are online. So, are there any questions from audience for yeah, uh, our speakers? For Santa, yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is to Janindra. Uh, is he online? Hi, yeah, hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi. Uh, Janindra, nice uh, talk. Uh, I have one question, practical question in this part of the world. Uh, we actually started doing TATMEs in 2015. Of course, with uh, we didn't have air seal. Uh, what we did was with our high flow system and evacuation system, we managed to do, but the practical main problem is our uh, platform. So gel port path is not available here. So we started with, uh, we hand carried few and started doing it. Uh, any any advice from you to use another, pl any other platform which can be reused uh, uh, to carry on this? Or autoclavable platforms? So um, personally, I have no major experience with it, but um, Frankman have uh, uh, put up a platform which is a lot cheaper than the gel point, which is another option. Um, and in terms of the air seal as well, I think that there are cheap options like Lexion. So things have sort of progressed, if you like, uh, in terms of being a little bit cheaper, but nothing is non-disposable yet. All right, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Jainda. Another question uh, regarding uh, TATME. Any particular length you recommend uh, from the anal verge uh, to carry on the TATME? Um, you can go as short as you want. And actually, as I was saying before, um, and that might also answer Bantha's question, um, if you look up the article by Professor Antonino Spinelli from Milan, he, he developed what's called the TTSS, which actually allows you to make the dissection completely from the abdominal area and then make the final dissection, which can be incredibly low, um, uh, just through the transanal approach. And I think that takes away all the needs you have for um, uh, TATME uh, and allows you the same uh, issues about uh, um, being able to make your uh, dissection uh, uh, through the transanal approach, and therefore you can actually uh, um, you can actually still uh, have your tumor um, removed appropriately. Right. Thank you. And Janindra, one more question. Uh, so, do you? Do you retrieve the specimens uh, per annually or do you open uh, to retrieve the specimens? Um, you can do both and I sort of uh, go depending on, uh, I mean don't forget I use the single port technique uh, abdominally so for to retrieve the specimen abdominally is not that hard, you don't have to make another incision. But if you, if you are making another incision and you have got a uh, gel point or something similar, then it's easy to take it out transanally as well. One more question to Seka. Uh, hi, Seka, are you there with us? Yes, Mr. yeah. Thanks, Bhavanta, yeah. Uh, with regard to HIPEC, uh, uh, metastatic disease, uh, is there any better response uh, for colorectal metastasis than uh, other metastatic disease or vice versa? What is your experience? The, uh, the evidence um, is um, that the colorectal metastasis, um, there is some evidence, Bhavanta. It is not as good as what we thought it would be, and that is what the Prodigy 7 has uh, highlighted. But they used oxaloplatin, whereas uh, the evidence for uh, 
the uh, response was using mitomycin. So there is some evidence, but I think the key is um, achieving complete cytoreduction, achieving um, an CC0 at the end of your surgery. So, uh, and that is where the decision making comes in. If someone has got peritoneal metastasis, the MDT where you have a dedicated uh, radiologist who looks at the CT and um, shows that the PCI score is less than 20 and uh, there's no small ball mesentery involvement, then you can achieve a better, um, you know, better outcome with surgery. And then adding HIPEC is like a belt and braces approach. Recently, the ovarian uh, group, um, the OVPEC one, where they have shown evidence, and it, it, as a matter of fact, I'm sure you, uh, you all know from the sort of oncology literature that the chemotherapy, systemic chemotherapy, works very well with ovarian cancers. They just may basically melt the tumor away. And these patients are now offered um, HIPEC, and uh, we are now just, uh, doing a pilot at the Christie. And and um, the preliminary results um, is that uh, the ovarian cancer patients also benefit from it. I think the response probably is better in ovarian cancer. Thanks. Thank you. Seka, uh, can I ask whether there is a whether there is any difference between uh, the in surgical perspective when you perform cytoreduction surgery for PMP and against uh, colorectal metastasis? As, as you Sorry, I missed the first part of your question. Yeah. Whether there is any difference in, in surgical perspective when you do carry out cytoreductive surgery uh, is there a difference for PMP against uh, colorectal metastasis? Because as you mentioned, that if I got it correct, uh, do you really need not to do a complete peritonectomy in uh, colorectal mets? Well, basically, when I say complete peritonectomy, it is it, what people think is that removing the whole peritoneum of the patient, which is not physically possible. It is basically the diseased peritoneum. And at the end of uh, the cytoreduction, you achieve a CC0. So basically, you start off where wherever the disease spots are, you uh, resect it with, and, and then at the end of your surgery, it looks like you have removed the disease. That, that is what we aim for. Is there a difference between PMP and um, a, a CRPM for uh, um, as far as how you do the site reduction? Yeah, that's a very good question. The reason is, if you, if one can achieve a CC0 or a CC1 where there's a sliver of mucin in the small bowel mesentery, uh, you don't need to be very aggressive in PMP because uh, they are usually acellular mucin and adding HIPEC, the survival curves are the same for CC0 and CC1. Whereas with CRPM, if you, if you have a, if one achieves a CC0 and a CC1 in a similar group of patients, there is a difference in survival because as we all know, if it is a CC1 where you leave 0.25 centimeters of disease behind because they are in the mesentery or in the small bowel, or quite extensive disease, then the disease does come back. And um, so there is a difference. So we don't need to be very aggressive in PMP as far as if there is a sliver of mucin left behind, whereas in uh, CRPM, I think it we, we need to aim to achieve a CC0. Although there is some evidence now that even with C um, CC1, when you add high pec, it shifts the curve to the right, which basically means that there is some survival benefit, but it's not as good as C CC0. Uh, thank, right, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, now we are uh, running behind the time, and uh, I can see a lot of enthusiasm uh, regarding the questions, uh, but I think we have to uh, wind up the session. Thank you for all uh, four speakers uh, uh, with their uh, uh, sharing with their uh, great experiences on behalf of the College of Surgeons. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you.